Second, and no less significant, is the explicit, explicit disclaimer disassociating atmosphere from anything like the air of heaven. This endows what follows with a distinctive significance. For what is described is summarized in the phrase excessive antiquity. What is excessive about this antiquity is that it takes place in a nature that is exposed to time without the glimmer of a redemptive promise. And this affects not simply individual objects and subjects that constitute the house of Usher, but the whole house itself, a house that includes the tradition of a family as much as the material building itself. Although the house itself still appears to be sound, there are signs of extraordinary dilapidation and above all, a wild inconsistency between its still perfect ad adaptation of parts and the crumbling condition of the individual stones. The whole, therefore, seems intact, although there is a suspicion of the specious totality of the old woodwork, which has rotted for long years. Despite the absence of manifest instability, the description closes with a fatal perhaps, which I'll repeat again, perhaps the eye of a scrutinizing observer might have discovered a barely perceptible fissure, which extending from the roof of the building in front made its way down the wall in a zigzag direction until it became lost in the sullen waters of the Tarn. This dangerous perhaps, as Nietzsche might have called it, will of course portend the fatal fall of the House of Usher. But it, it presents an image, it presents as an image a, a kind of counter or negative image. Not an object, not the house as a structure, but a certain absence, a defect, a barely perceptible fissure, described as something that seems to follow its own trajectory, making its way down the wall in a zigzag direction until it disappears or becomes lost in the sullen waters of the Tarn. How very different this literary image is from the radio images that populated my youth. How different, and yet in some ways, how related. Poe's nature is profoundly related to that described by Walter Benjamin in his study of the origin of the German morning play. It is that of a fallen nature that lacks any hope of salvation. It's the nature that Benjamin ascribes or analyzes in post-Reformation Germany, to be sure. And Poe is, of course, situated in a Gothic tradition. But it's also the nature against which the myth of the American hero was designed to fight, to subdue, and finally to triumph over. Superman overcoming the forces of evil, but constantly threatened by a congenital vulnerability, by an Achilles heel in the form of kryptonite, an element from another galaxy that perhaps reflected the dull concern with natural elements that, un that unleashed the destruction of the atomic bomb and thus enabled the triumph of the United States over the Japanese. Kryptonite was the element, however, that could rob Superman of his force just as Samson lost much of his strength when his hair was cut by Delilah. Samson, to be sure, still had the strength to bring down the house, destroying his enemies by destroying him, by sacrificing himself. Such a gesture, however, remained foreign to the American myths with which I grew up, at least. Perhaps that's why the acts of the Japanese kamikaze had such a traumatic effect on the American soldiers and sailors in the Pacific, and why to this very day, the self-sacrificial strategy of so-called suicide bombers continues to haunt the civilizations of the West, in particular that of the United States, and continues to disrupt their military and political strategies. It's in this context, in any case, that Poe's description of the House of Usher, both its external and internal atmospheres, is particularly suggestive, for it relates a certain type of manifestation and hence a certain kind of image to two factors that play, I believe, a decisive role in American and perhaps more generally in Western culture, to time and to death. <laughs> 
In regard to these two factors, the image appears to be ambivalent. On the one hand, it seems to secure that which it images, usually by representing it, to secure it from the ravages of a temporal process that would otherwise wear it out and use up everything subjected to it, above all, however, individual living beings. And for American culture, and again, perhaps for Western culture more generally, the perspective of the individual becomes determining with the advent of the Reformation, which rejects the ability of a universal church to secure redemption and grace for its members. Luther's doctrine of sola fides, of faith alone, as the only path to salvation, makes the Christian promise of resurrection depend not on external institutions and their practices, nor even on good works per se, but rather on the less visible, more interior experience of faith as that to which the individual mortal gains access to God. Hence, there is a tendency very visible or legible in Poe's story for external nature to appear as fallen without hope for survival. The House of Usher, as well as its inhabitants, is an example of this. The atmosphere it exudes and that the narrator breathes consists of an air of stern, deep, and irredeemable gloom, whereby the emphasis should, I believe, fall on the word irredeemable. It is this impossibility of redemption that condemns mortals to decay and destruction, a fate already embodied in the external appearance of the house of Usher itself. The image that Poe's story gives us of this house thus both preserves and also confirms this fatal destiny. It resists the wear and tear of time while at the same time implementing it. It implements it not just by representing it, as in the final scene of Poe's story, in which the fall of the House of Usher recalls, today at least, the incessantly replayed images of the collapsing Twin Towers. This is a quote four on your sheet. Suddenly, suddenly, there shot along the path a wild light, and I turned to see whence a gleam so unusual could have issued, for the vast house and its shadows were alone behind me. The radiance was that of the full setting and blood-red moon, which now shone vividly through that once barely discernible fissure of which I have before spoken as extending from the roof of the building in a zigzag direction to the base. While I gazed, this fissure rapidly widened. There came a fierce breadth of the whirlwind. The entire orb of the satellite burst at once upon my sight. My brain reeled as I saw the mighty walls rushing asunder. There was a long, tumultuous shouting sound like the voice of a thousand waters and the deep and dank tarn at my feet closed sullenly and silently over the fragments of the House of Usher. The fall of the House of Usher is also therefore the fall of the living beings it contains who contribute to that long, tumultuous shouting sound like the voice of a thousand waters as the building that houses them, that was to protect them from the outside, itself collapses and takes them with it. What is left is the reader, who implicitly follows the trajectory of the narrator. Both survive the fall, the fall of the house of Usher, but only, only by fleeing from it, just as the narrator ushers in his final description by describing his terrified flight from the scene. From that chamber and from that mansion, I fled aghast. It is only by fleeing and by, as it were, putting an image between oneself fleeing and the danger, the danger from which one is trying to escape, it seems that survival is made possible. 